Hello, in this video, I'm going to discuss transfer of learning. Um, so transfer of learning is the idea that we learn a motor skill in a practice environment and we need to be able to transfer what we've learned from that practice environment into another environment like a competition environment or performance situation or a testing environment. Um, so that's transfer of learning. The learner needs to be able to transfer the learned capability from one environment to a different environment. Um, when we are learning a skill after we've learned other skills previously, those skills that we've learned in the past sometimes will make the new skill easier to learn. It can interfere with learning or it could have no effect at all. So that's what I'll talk about throughout this lecture is those different situations. Um, the sequence of skills that we learn when we're learning a sport or we're rehabilitating an injury, uh, the sequence of skills that we're learning is really important because some skills that we learn are going to enhance or interfere with the skills that we learn next. So getting them in the right order is really important if we're going to have an effective motor skills learning environment, whether that be learning a sport or in a rehabilitation setting. Um, so a few terms here. First, transfer of learning uh, is the influence of previous experiences on performing a skill in a new context or on learning a new skill. So how does what we've learned before transfer to what we're learning now? Or how does what we've learned in practice transfer into a new setting? Um, so as I mentioned, sometimes what we've learned already can have a positive effect, a negative effect, or no effect at all. So positive transfer is when our previous experience facilitates learning or transferring of that skill to a new environment. Negative transfer is when the previous experience gets in the way of learning um, or transferring to a new environment. And zero transfer means there was no effect. Um, so here are the two main hypotheses about why positive transfer occurs. Uh, so first is the identical elements theory. So the idea here is that uh, the transfer is due to the degree of similarity between the component parts or the characteristics. Um, so if the kinematics are similar between two skills, so um, maybe the way that we reach, you know, the specific amount of flexion, extension, you know, something about the kinematics of the movement is similar enough. Or it could be that the types of corrections that are required for the two skills are similar. Uh, so like if both skills require dynamic balance or similar muscle control, you know, same muscle groups, um, similar types of coordination or aspects of coordination. Um, so if some of the, the types of corrections that need to be made during that, um, the two skills, if those are similar, uh, then they might be similar enough that positive transfer occurs. The other hypothesis is called transfer appropriate processing theory. Um, so that's the idea that if the cognitive processing required between two skills are similar enough, then there will be positive transfer. So like if two skills both require fast decision making, then having mastered the first skill might lead to uh, faster decision making um, out of the gate without any practice or learning the new skill when you're beginning to learn that new skill. Uh, so like fast decision making, problem solving, attention control. So cognitive processes that maybe you've practiced with the previous skill now might transfer to the new skill and sort of give you a head start in learning. Negative transfer. Um, again, that's where your past skills might interfere with your learning of the new skill. So an example of that would be um, like if you play tennis um, you generally will keep your wrist stiff when you hit the ball. And then maybe if you're learning badminton, in badminton, you snap your wrist. And so there might be some negative transfer where you have the habit of what to do with your wrist from tennis. And now you're having to relearn the skill and what you've already, that past skill in tennis might be interfering with learning that new skill. 
Um, or if you went in the opposite direction, same problem. Uh, but thankfully, negative transfer is um, temporary. It doesn't happen that often. The skills have to be very similar, like what I just described. Um, and even when it does happen, the, the effects are temporary. It generally only happens in the very beginning, in the early learning stage. Uh, and then you can overcome that with practice. Um, it occurs when a previously experienced stimulus requires a different response. So like the ball coming towards you and you're going to hit the ball, but now it's a shuttlecock coming towards you and you need to hit it, but with a different racket and with different form. Um, so the stimulus and the environment are similar, but now you need to respond with a different uh, motor response. Uh, so similar environmental context characteristics, but the movement characteristics are different. Um, so negative transfer is most likely to occur if there's a change in spatial locations for the movement or a change in the timing structure of the movement. Um, so spatial locations, that could be like, you know, maybe you're really used to driving your car and then you get in a friend's car to drive their car. More or less, it's going to be the same action. It's going to be all the same movements, the same coordination patterns. Um, but in the new car, everything's going to be in a slightly different place. So a little bit of a different spatial location. Uh, you know, the pedals might be in a slightly different place. The, the stick might be in a slightly different place. All the little levers and buttons and everything's a little bit different. Um, so change in spatial locations. Um, and then the second scenario is a change in the timing structure. So um, maybe you're learning the steps in a dance and now you're trying to relearn it with a new rhythm. Um, so in that case, the old rhythm that you danced to, or maybe you're playing a new music piece or something, uh, but if you've learned a previous rhythm that now you're trying to learn a new rhythm, then there will probably be some interference from what you've learned previously uh, that, that might get in the way a little bit of learning that new rhythm. So why negative transfer occurs? There are three proposed reasons. Um, so the first is the memory representation. Um, so specific perception action coupling develops in response to performing a skill and becomes part of the memory representation for the action. Okay, so when we learn and practice a skill, we couple our perception of the environment. So what are we perceiving that's happening and what are we perceiving that's happening within our own body? And we couple that with the motor response. So if we practice a skill and we establish this memory representation of the perception action coupling. And now we need to produce a new response to that perception. Now we have to sort of uncouple and make a new coupling. So that could be part of why negative transfer occurs. The second is cognitive confusion, which is exactly what it sounds like. Confusion about what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so it's like if you're driving in another country where you drive on the opposite side of the road from where you're used to, um, you know, obviously cognitively, you know, you're supposed to drive on that side of the road, but you might keep forgetting or it might feel really uncomfortable and weird because you're on the wrong side of the road compared to what you're used to. Or if you're using a new keyboard and you don't know quite where all the keys are, you know, maybe the shift key or the command key or whatever is in a different place. Um, so cognitive confusion, like there's no issue with coordination or control of the movement, but you just simply are confused about where things are, what you should be doing. And then lastly is intrinsic dynamics. Uh, so task specific coordination tendencies can transfer from one task to another. And these intrinsic dynamics may cooperate or compete with the new skill that is being learned. Um, so we learn all sorts of specific coordination patterns um, that we transfer and use for many different skills that are, are widely applicable to lots of different things that we do. And in some cases, those coordination tendencies will help with a new skill. And in that case, that would be positive transfer. But sometimes it competes with the new skill and we have to sort of unlearn that tendency to learn the new one. And in that case, that would be negative transfer. 
Um, that can also occur retroactively, meaning that you need to sort of unlearn that coordination tendency to learn the new one. And in some cases, it can actually interfere with your ability to complete the old skill, the previous skill that required that previous coordination tendency that now you're you're trying to break the habit. Like if we think back to the tennis and badminton situation, maybe you start snapping your wrist to play badminton. And now when you go back to tennis, it might be harder for you to keep that wrist strong and stable now that you've established that new coordination pattern of snapping the wrist. Okay, bilateral transfer uh, is referring to how we can learn a skill with one hand and that skill has a positive transfer effect to the other hand. Uh, so when transfer of learning relates to learning the same task, but with the other limb, um, it's also referred to as intermanual transfer, cross transfer, or cross education. Um, so the idea is that once we learn a skill with one hand, it makes it faster and easier to learn the skill with the other hand. So there is debate about whether bilateral transfer is symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetric means that it doesn't matter which hand you learn it with first, that there will be an equal amount of bilateral transfer. So I could learn a skill with my left hand or my right hand, and it will transfer equally. Asymmet asymmetric transfer means that uh, when a person is learning a skill, um, they're going to learn it better by starting with a certain hand, and then it's going to transfer better to the other hand. So the idea is like, maybe it's better that I learn the skill first with my dominant hand, and then it will transfer better to my non-dominant hand or vice versa. So asymmetric transfer just means that there is a better hand to start with. It's not equal in terms of which one we should start with. Now, there's also debate about which hand is better. Oh, and I should, I should say... Um, it is commonly accepted that asymmetric transfer is the case. So there's debate between asymmetric and symmetric transfer. And generally, we agree that asymmetric transfer is true. So it, there does seem to be um, a difference depending on which hand you start with. Now there's debate about which hand you should start with. Um, so it is more generally accepted that there's more transfer if you start with your preferred limb. So if you start with your dominant hand, there will be more transfer to the non-dominant. Now that is debated. Not everybody agrees, but there is more evidence to support starting with the dominant and then transferring to the non-dominant. So why does bilateral transfer occur? There are two ways to look at this. Both are probably in, at play. Both are probably true. Um, there's the cognitive explanation um, that when you learn a new skill, we get a lot of cognitive information about how to complete that skill. So when you first learn to do something, you have to learn what to do and how to do it. So you need all that information about, okay, you're going to move this way, then you're going to do this. Here are some cues you could look for. So if you learn all of those things to do with something with one hand, all that information equally applies if you're going to conduct the skill with the other hand. Um, so that cognitive transfer um, kind of gives you a jump start on you, when you're using the other hand. The motor control explanation um, says that practicing the skill with one, one limb establishes a GMP, a generalized motor program. And that GMP, because it is generalized, we can use to apply to the other limb equally, even if we learned it initially with the first limb. Uh, if we look at it from a dynamical systems theory perspective, um, basically we are creating an abstract representation of how to coordinate the movement. And again, just like with the GMP, we can apply that abstract representation of the movement to either limb, regardless of which one we start with. Then finally, brain interhemispheric transfer occurs. So even if I'm doing something with my right hand, and my left hemisphere is controlling my right hand, I will also have activation in the same motor areas on the right hemisphere as I do on the left hemisphere. So the brain is actually developing these motor plans and these motor components on both sides of the brain, even though I'm using the right hand. Um, so that kind of gives the, the other hand a jump start or a head start on being able to uh, coordinate and execute that motion 
Um, and so it just takes a little bit of practice and pretty soon you'll be able to do it equally on both sides. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.